Well, hello, everybody. My name is Maynard King. I'm uh, one of the deacons here, and I'm also on the preaching team. And I'd like to welcome you to West End Baptist Church and uh, also to our family in Gander. I want to welcome you as well. And anyone who's uh, watching this over the Internet, so glad that you could join us this morning. I'm going to preach a message this morning based on 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. So if you have a Bible and you want to turn there, the first thing I'm going to do is read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We have previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those, as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. You know we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else. Even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority, instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our own lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We work night and day for, in order to, not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. God always adds his blessing to the reading of his word. My sermon today is, is titled, Not Only the Gospel. Now the, the book of 1 Thessalonians is the very first epistle written by the Apostle Paul. The very first book he wrote. And it's also... One of the oldest books, it's, it was the second book in the New Testament to be written, okay? So it's early on. A little bit of background on this book. Uh, it was around 50 A.D. Paul and Silas and Timothy were in Philippi. They were preaching the gospel there, of course, and they faced opposition. They were beaten, black and blue. They were thrown in jail. And, of course, you know the story of how there was an earthquake while they were singing and their chains fell off and they were miraculously freed from jail. Well, from there, they went to a couple of other towns, including Thessalonica. Now, Hannah and I argued that she, she said it's pronounced Thessalonica, but she listens to too many American preachers. I know it's Thessalonica <laughs> because... I, I remember, I'm sure I remember Jerry Newberry singing the old gospel song, I played my harmonica in Thessalonica. <laughs> so, it's not a real song, but anyways, I'm right. So Paul preached in Thessalonica for two or three weeks, okay? He was in the synagogue reasoning with the Jews there, but I know he was there longer than that because he had to send, we, we read in, in uh in Philippians, that he had to get aid, financial aid and food aid from Philippi. Also in verse 9, he said something about working night and day. Paul worked to support himself in his usual business, which is making tents. So I know he was there probably months or longer. Either way, a bunch of people in Thessalonica believed his message. And when he left, he left a strong, believing, thriving sanctified and suffering church. But again, he faced opposition. And we read about that opposition that he faced. Luke records it for us in Acts 17, verses 5 to 9. And 
I'll read that. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. Now, you know what? The King James Version has some really cool words for the words bad characters. So I'm, the King James Version calls them lewd fellows of the baser sort. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring those words back. Let's read it again. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some lewd fellows of the baser sort from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Jason welcomed them into his house. They're defying all of Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. They made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. So the Jews did not like this gospel message that Paul and Silas and Timothy were preaching. They did not like it. People were following those guys from one town to the next, slandering them, undermining them, trying to tear them down. It came to the point that their friends in Thessalonica had to send them away in the middle of the night to escape. So it's a year or two later. Paul's in Athens, about a couple of hundred miles to the south of Thessalonica, and he gets word from Timothy that people are saying stuff about him and his gospel message. They're slandering him. They're trying to undermine him. They're trying to cast doubt on his message so that they can also then cast doubt on the experience of God that the people in Thessalonica were having. They were saying, Paul is fake. He's greedy. He's only after your money. He's only after power. And you can tell that when Paul wrote this letter then, 1 Thessalonians, he's like a defendant. He's, he's talking like a defendant in the, in the dock at a court. He says things like, you know, surely you remember. You were witnesses. God is witness. <laughs> Have you ever heard someone accuse you of something that you didn't do? And you had to talk like that? I wasn't like that. You were there, right? I didn't say those things. You know I didn't. And this is the way that Paul is talking throughout this whole passage. The strange thing is, Paul doesn't defend any doctrine in this passage, in verses 1 to 12. He doesn't lay out any systematic theology. He doesn't flex his apologetics muscles and, and straighten them out on doctrine. None of that. Instead, he chooses to defend himself. And I know Paul well enough to know that he didn't do that for the purpose of vindicating himself. He doesn't care about himself. He's used to people talking smack about him. Paul is. It's as simple as that. But he chooses to defend himself because in proving that he was real among them, he can, he's going to prove that his message was real and that the experience of God that the Thessalonians were having was also real. So Paul calls attention to what kind of people he and Timothy and Silas were when they were with those Thessalonians. What kind of people we were. And you know what? I'm so glad that Paul had enemies. Otherwise, he would not have said these verses, verses 1 to 12, and they're simply awesome. They're awesome because they paint a picture of what a true servant of God looks like. They paint a picture of the heart of a person who is making disciples. This text answers the question, what do I need to be like if I'm going to make disciples for Christ? What does it take if I'm going to make disciples, if I'm going to obey the Great Commission? What kind of heart do I have to have if I'm going to help people come to Christ. And this applies to all of us, folks. It especially applies to pastors. And this section is often used to preach about what a pastor should be like. 
but really it applies to every single one of us because we are called to make disciples, right? In the Great Commission, Jesus told us to go into all the world and make disciples. I want to focus particularly on verse 8. And there Paul says, Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel, but our lives as well. Now there's a lot more behind that word lives than you see at first glance. In other versions, it's translated selves. We gave you our very selves. And in another version, it's translated souls. We gave you our souls as well. So what I want you to understand here today is that to be effective in ministering, to be effective as a disciple maker, to fulfill your duty given to you in the Great Commission, you need to share not only the gospel, and that's the most important thing, not only that, you need to share your soul with other people. So what does it mean to share your soul? I'll tell you what it isn't. It isn't just sharing the gospel. That's pretty clear by the way he says it, right? He says, not only the gospel, but our own soul. You can share information. And you know what? The gospel is the most important information that you could ever share. But if you have shared the gospel with someone else, you have not shared your own soul. So what is it to share your soul? Just look at Paul in these verses. Look at Paul sharing his soul to the Thessalonians. 2 and 17, he says, we wanted to see you so bad, we did everything we could do to come see you. In 2 and 20, he says, you are our joy. In 3 and 5, he says, when I couldn't stand it any longer, I sent Timothy to come find out about you. And in 3 and 7 and 8, he says, we were so comforted to find out about you that now we can really live knowing about your faith. In 3 and 10, he says, night and day we pray that we can see you again. Now those words sound more like a love letter written by a, a newlywed 20-year-old than it does a, uh, an apostle to one of his church plants, doesn't it? So Paul spends this text showing how he and Timothy and Silas shared their own soul with the Thessalonians. The first six verses are kind of an x-ray. What is it inside a person that makes them share their... What, what does sharing your soul look like on the inside? And then the, the next six verses, 7 to 12, are more of a picture. How does that work out if you're sharing your own soul with someone? I'm going to point out seven ways they shared their soul. These are the things that we must do if we will obey the Great Commission. If we will obey the Spirit, we have to live this way towards others so that the Spirit will bring those people to Christ. The first way, they gave of themselves despite suffering. Verse 2, he says, We have previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. So despite being beaten and jailed, Paul and Timothy and Silas did not shy away from completing that exact same mission in Thessalonica. They took the risk and they obeyed God. You know, to get involved in real ministry means taking risks. You may not be beaten with rods and thrown in jail like they were, but there will be a cost if you will do true ministry, if you will truly be a disciple maker. There's a saying that Kim and I have in our house, ministry is a sacrifice. Because you know what? True ministry costs you something. It does. It costs you something. It might cost you time. It might cost you money. It might just cost you convenience, getting phone calls in the middle of the night. It's going to cost you something to really, truly do ministry. And you know what? It's easier and it's safer 
and it's probably cheaper just to go into your own house and close the door, you know, close that garage door when you drive in and not worry about anybody else except for yourself and your own immediate family. But if you do that, you can't be an effective disciple maker. If personal cost or personal risk is the cutoff point for how far you're willing to go to share the gospel, to bring others to Christ, then you won't be effective. You know, to get involved in the lives of others, to share your soul, it's messy. You can be in the middle of marriage breakups, uh, in, the, in alcoholism, drug addictions, domestic disturbances. You might even have the witness to lewd fellows of the baser sort. But this is exactly what Christ wants to do in you. And it's what you can do. And it's what you're made to do. The second way is that they did not mislead those Thessalonians. They did not use deceit. Verse 3 says, For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. Paul gave them the truth. There was no sales pitch. It wasn't a prosperity gospel. It's no good to give people a message that just tickles their ears or makes them feel good. It's no good to tell people, oh, Jesus will give you a better life. Jesus will give you health and prosperity and wealth. It's no good to tell people that stuff at all. The gospel literally means good news. The good news, of course, is that God sent his son to die on the cross in our place. And that he was buried and he rose from the, the grave again. But for that message to mean what it really needs to mean, it has to be preceded with the bad news. That humans are separated from God. That they're alienated from their creator because we selfishly turned away from him. Please, if you're not a follower of Christ, know that there is a great gulf between you and God. A great separation between you and God. And all the good deeds that you can try to do in this world will not close that gap. Won't bring you back into God's favor. There was a punishment due. But God sent his son to take your place. You only have to believe in what he did for you. To believe in him. And that's the plain truth. That's the only way for you to come to God. And my fellow Christians, if we're going to share the gospel message with integrity, not misleading, not using deceit, we have to tell it like that. Because God trusted us with that message. And before I finish that point, verse 4 says, On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. Paul says it right there. We're approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. It's like if this folder was the gospel and God handed it over to me and said, Maynard, this is the only way for humans to be saved, to not face certain death. I'm giving it to you. I'm trusting you with this message. What should be my reaction to that? Take that message and say, take a deep breath and say, wow, God, I will do everything that you say. I will take that message to others. The third way is that they did not please men. They didn't speak to please men. They only spoke to please God. Verse 4 says, we are not trying to please people but God. And verse 6 says, we were not looking for praise from people. One of the biggest problems with a lot of people today is that they really want people to like them. They always speak to please people. And when you do that, you can be fake, phony. You won't be able to communicate the truth of the gospel effectively if you talk like that. You know, people can smell that a mile away. They really can and being real is refreshing. 
I've got a friend who has Asperger's, and uh, if you know people with Asperger's, I, I love this guy, but he, he cannot lie. He, he just can't, and he speaks his mind, and that, that can be a real problem for him sometime. But when he first met me, he said, wow, you're really short. Do you have dwarfism? Right? <laughs> well, and it's not that you got to be like that. Well, he's a friend of mine. I love that guy. When that guy says, I'm grateful for what you did for me, I know he means it. When that guy says, I prayed for you today, then I know he's telling the truth. Whereas if you speak to please others, then everything that comes out of your mouth is calculated. Are they going to like me? What are they going to think when I say this? That's a sad way to be. We need to be real if we're going to be effective at sharing the gospel. The same thing goes in small groups. You know, there, how small groups are effective is that when people get to know each other, the masks come off, right? It's the same reason that camp ministry is so effective. By like day three of camp, the masks come off and kids w are real and the counselors are real. And that's how we need to be with others if we will help bring them to Christ. Real. Not speaking to please people, but God. With our hearts flayed open so that people can see our very soul. The fourth way is that they did not use flattery. Now what is flattery? Verse 5, you know we, didn't, we never use flattery nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. Flattery is simply using language manipulatively. It doesn't even have to be false. It's, it just means that when you're talking to someone, there's an angle to it. You're trying to get something, whether it's money or approval. It means you're always thinking of what you can get by the words you're saying. That's flattery. And false teachers in Paul's day used it all the time. That's what they did. False teachers today still do the same thing. You can't trust what they say because you know it has an angle. To be an effective disciple maker, to share your very soul, there is no room for being manipulative in your speech. And you know what? The church needs to do everything it can to show others that it's not about money. You know, we need to bend over backwards to say this isn't about money. It's never about money. I mean, look at what Paul did in verse 9. He said, Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. So Paul was so intent on making sure that they knew this was not about money that he didn't even take pay as an apostle of Jesus, which he could have. Because Jesus was well known by this time. But he did not take pay. Instead, he preached the gospel all day long. And all night long, he made tents to sell them, his usual business. He wanted to make sure that the gospel message was not tainted in any way whatsoever. The fifth way is that they put aside their position of power and became like a mother. Verse 7 and 8. Instead, we were like young children among you, just as a nursing mother cares for her children. So we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Paul groped for the right words to say here. He thought to himself, how, how can I describe how I felt? How can I describe what I became for you Thessalonians? And what he said is astonishingly beautiful. He says, do you know what the gospel did to me in Thessalon Thessalonica? It made me like a mother nursing her children. And what mother who ever got up in the middle of the night to nurse and rock her baby, ever held anything back from that baby. I remember Kim 
with Maria in the middle of the night when she was a baby. The love, the tenderness, the care, the sacrifice. There simply is no more intimate relationship in humanity than that relationship. And Paul cared so much for these people that he was ministering to, and they weren't his best friends, and they weren't his relatives. He was preaching the gospel to them. But he cared so much that he made himself that vulnerable. A great theologian. Some of you have money. Some of you have power. Some of you have lots of education. Some of you have lots of influence. Be careful that these things do not stop, that do not let you be that vulnerable. Be careful that the, these things don't stop you from being like Paul, from being like a mother to others. Can you be that gentle, that loving, when you're dealing with others and leading them to Christ? What's a mother like anyway? When a child is hungry, the mother gives it food. No matter how many mistakes the child makes, love and compassion from a mother doesn't cease. To, be, to a good mother, it doesn't matter how dirty or sticky or messy or smelly the child is. It doesn't matter how poorly dressed it is or how needy it is or how much it misbehaves. The mother still looks at that child with love. She'll take that child and clean it up and bathe it and change its clothes and feed it and teach it. And it doesn't even matter that the child is going to be just as dirty and sticky and messy and smelly tomorrow. She'll show that love all over again. There's just no more intimate relationship. What an example. Can you be like a mother nursing her child when you're leading others to Christ? With the people in your life that you know need Jesus. The answer to that is yes. Yes, you can. Because that is who you are. Christ wants to do that through you. The sixth way, Paul's ministry was holy, righteous, and blameless. Verse 10 says, you are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. Now, Paul there is not saying that he was perfect. That's not what he's saying. The word blameless in Paul's writing doesn't mean that. It's kind of like, the qualifications of a deacon it means a similar thing. It means being right before God. It means being above reproach. It means that when you did offend somebody, you apologized for it, and you left no offense unanswered. That's what it means to be blameless. Paul was both real and good. And what a beautiful thing when a servant of God can be both real and good. The seventh and final way is that Paul was like a father. Verses 11 and 12 say, For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So first, Paul was like a mother, gentle, nursing, feeding. And now he's like a father, encouraging, Leading. Maybe some of you didn't have a good earthly father. But if a good father is supposed to put his arm around the kid and say, come on, we can do this. You can do this. A father should be there to instruct, to implore the child to do the right thing. It's just another illustration of what it's like to share your soul with somebody else. It's just another picture of the level of investment that you need to have in the lives of the people that you want to lead to Christ. That's the level of investment you need. Sharing your own soul is letting people see inside you. Not concealing your true feelings. It means taking off the mask and let people see who you really are. Your true life, not the life that is all set up and has got the best lighting and all framed like a 14-year-old girl's Instagram page. Not that life. Your true life. 
It's a, a, shared, a shared soul is a shared passion, a shared longing. There's no posing, no posturing, no pretense. It's inviting people into your home, to your table, to see you at your best and to see you at your worst. It means showing hospitality even when the dirty dishes are piled up or when the floor hasn't been cleaned in a week. Show hospitality anyway. That's sharing your soul. It means laying your heart out on the table for everybody to see. Being real about your own sin. Being real about your own weaknesses and your own need for God's forgiveness. That's sharing your soul. As I mentioned, that's also the reason why small groups are so effective. And in our small groups, we need to recognize this reality. That maybe they are our best avenue for making disciples for Christ. I believe they are. So more of our small groups need to be the open kind, right? Not the kind where you've got you and your closest friends in this church and you all share with each other. I understand that. And it's a great thing that you can do that. But maybe you could start another one. Or just be open enough that you, you invite others to come into your small group. And invite them to discuss the questions of life. To explore spirituality with you. To contemplate those questions. Extend the invitation to some non-Christians in your life. Or like I said, just start another one. Because everybody has those deep questions in their heart. What's life all about anyway? You know, what's the point of it all? Does God exist? If he does, does he care about me? A small group is a great place to explore those questions. So making friends with non-Christians on that level, where you share your very soul with them, I believe is essential for, for making disciples, for bringing others to Christ, for helping people to find new life in Christ. Not that it adds anything to the message. I'm not saying it adds anything. And I'm not saying the message itself is not sufficient in itself, because it is. But it's clear in the Bible that we are tasked with spreading that message. And what better way to do it than to be like Paul and to share our own soul. So you need to ask yourself, are there non-Christians in my life that I am sharing my very soul with now? Am I opening my home and my table to those who need Christ? My neighbors. Folks, I'm telling you this because this is what it will take to grow West End Baptist Church. This is also what it will take to grow our Gander Church. A newly renovated building is awesome, and new programs are awesome, and maybe a new speaker in the pulpit, awesome again. But unless we also do that, share our soul with others, then we will not be effective, and we will not see the potential that God has in mind for us. Showing hospitality, by the way, is a practical outworking of sharing your soul. Don't say, I don't have the gift of hospitality, okay? Not a, show me where in scripture hospitality is called a spiritual gift, because it's not. It's not a spiritual gift. In fact, it's commanded. It's commanded to show hospitality to others. It doesn't matter what your house is like. You know, it doesn't matter how much hospitality you can afford. The best hospitality that I've ever gotten has always been, believe it or not, with immigrants living in basement apartments here in Newfoundland from other countries because in their culture it's so deeply rooted to show hospitality. And they had very little means, but they wanted so badly to share it with me. That's hospitality. Hospitality is not an extension of wealth. It is an extension of yourself. Remember that. Don't say that you don't have anything to give in sharing your soul. Don't say, I, I, 
I don't have the gifts. This church has lots of people with, you know, the ability to speak into others' lives and all that. And I'm not that kind of a person. Don't talk like that. When you think those thoughts, please know that that is a lie that Satan is whispering in your ear. Being good to others, sharing your soul with others, that's not something you have to try to do. It is who you are. You have Christ. You have the Holy Spirit within you. You have been given spiritual gifts. In John 4 and 14, Jesus said, whoever drinks the water that I will give him, and that's coming to Christ, that's being a Christian, whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. You are a spring of water. Don't stop up the spring. Don't clog the spring. Let it flow. Don't resist it. Become who you are in Christ and share your very soul. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here this, today and I pray that you would help them to extend themselves to others in that way to open their hearts up to others, to share their very soul with the people in their life that they know need Jesus, not just their best friends, but give them that kind of heart. We know that you've already done that when you've brought them to you, when your Holy Spirit came to live in them, that they have that kind of heart. Help them not, not to stop it up. Help them not to, res to resist it and to let you work in them, to treat total strangers the way a mother treats her nursing child. Help them treat total strangers as if they were their father. Give them that heart, I pray. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.